Welcome to another episode of Uncommon Decency, where we seek to explore the intellectual landscape of Europe. My name is Jorge Gonzalez Galarza. And my name is Francois. And we are very happy to have you join us on that Euro trip. I was nine when Angela Merkel became Chancellor of Germany. And she's still here, but only for a little longer. Just as she prepares to leave, a new book asks why the hell Germans do it better. Car, football, beer, politics, all of it apparently. So to better understand the new European superpower, we have with us John Kampner. Yes, we do. And we hope that everyone will enjoy the second episode of Uncommon Decency. Let's bring it on. Well, welcome for this, to the second episode of Uncommon Decency. Thank you all for listening. We are delighted this morning to be joined by John Kampner. John is a most distinguished author and journalist. He's most recently, and this is going to be the topic of our, of our conversation this morning, the author of, of a fantastic and very thoughtful book titled Why the Germans Do It Better, Notes from a Grown-Up Country, which uh, I was just congratulating here, John, a couple of minutes ago before going live because the book made it to the Sunday Times' bestseller list. So congratulations, John, and, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, and it's great to be here. John is also now a senior associate fellow at, at uh, RUSI, which uh, stands for the Royal United Services Institute. He's also a regular uh, columnist for The Times and The New European. Uh, he started out his career as a foreign correspondent for, for Reuters and for the Daily Telegraph in East Germany, where he got to witness uh, firsthand the fall of the Berlin Wall. He went on to become chief political correspondent for the Financial Times and editor of The New Statesman. And we really encourage everyone uh, listening to, to head over to the Amazon page for, for the book. For, grab a copy, uh, totally worth uh, anyone's time. This is a fantastic, uh, really deeply researched book. It's a collection of, of chapters and, and, and sort of essays on different uh, topics relating to sort of German public life. Really sort of a, a very interesting mix of anecdote and argument. My first question to you, John, would be, you know, you, you speak of Germany as a country that is uh, defined by, you know, prudence, uh, openness, political moderation, a culture of consensus building, right, whether that be in, in parliament or in, or in uh, company boards. And, and so in a nutshell, your, your book kind of seems to set Germany up for, for a role as the last guarantor of, of liberal democracy in a world that is overcome by populism and incompetence. Can you briefly describe, delve a little deeper into these themes and what made you write about them? Yeah, I mean, so as you mentioned, I, I was based in Germany, first in, in Bonn, the old capital, and then in East Berlin in the former GDR, but I was across both sides of the wall before the wall came down. And I've always kept in touch with Germany. And I suppose for me, it was unfinished business. My father was a, a Jewish refugee from Bratislava, what was then Czechoslovakia, and he had to flee as a result of the German invasion. And a lot of his extended family were killed in the concentration camps. Um, and then he met my, my Christian mom in, in actually in Singapore. Um, and I spent most of my life in the UK, but based also in Germany and in Russia and other places. And I've always been fascinated by Germany. I learned German at school, um, fell in love with the language, which to a lot of people comes over as quite croaky and harsh, but actually it's quite a beautiful language too. Um, and I just, as I saw my own country, the UK, descending into this dystopian narrative of nationalism and populism with the awful decision to leave the European Union through the referendum in 2016, followed by years of just parliamentary chaos, bumbling around, Britain becoming a laughing stock around the world. But really, that was as nothing compared to what was happening in the US. And obviously, American listeners need no recounting of what has happened courtesy of a, of a certain Donald J. Trump. And the abject horror and fear that people feel um, in the US and also here where I am in Germany um, about the prospect of a second term Trump uh, administration. So you see these two countries the US and the UK, who for Germans were always the beacons of democracy. They were the people that pretty much helped um, the good Germans to rebuild the country, not just economically, but also um, setting out a constitution that really is fit for purpose, 
um, and instilling a, a great love and adoration for for democracy and the difficult choices that democracy always requires. And so you have these two countries going in the wrong direction. Um, and that has really discombobulated Germans. They sort of scratch their heads and ask themselves, how can these two countries that we so admire um, <laughs> be so, so badly wrong? And the challenge for Germans now is this, that they've always... Uh, in some ways, this protection that was afforded to them, particularly by the Americans, uh, the big superpower in the Cold War, was a comfort blanket for them. It was a military security comfort blanket, but it was also a kind of societal, almost ideological comfort blanket. That's gone now. Um, and even if Joe Biden wins, the whole relationship is different now. And this really, and this is the bit of the book that, is quite challenging to Germans and for Germans, it is that in spite of their history, or, or more um, pertinently perhaps because of their history, it really is time for them now to step up and to really, in conjunction with others, help lead this kind of drive to protect liberal democracy. Mm. That um, context, I, I believe, is, is very manifest in your book uh, throughout. You, you, you have a lot of anecdotes of, of German friends of yours kind of coming up to you and, and, you know, and wondering, you know, what on earth has happened to the, to the good old parliamentary culture of, of the UK and the UK is, is, is headed for. And um, I guess what you just explained there um, is a good segue to, to maybe transition into sort of the foreign policy discussion. I think a lot of people... Uh, many in our audience in the United States are, are many times sort of aghast at, at German foreign policy. They they understand the reasons for it. They understand the, the kind of the historical reasons uh, for the, the non-interventionism, for the pacifism, for the difficulty the Germans have to orchestrate a, a kind of a solid uh, strategic posture in, in the world. And I want to ask you, you know, you, there, there, there are two main issues that really strike uh, people about German foreign policy, you know, as people wonder why is Germany, for instance, in the case of China, uh, you explain in the book that uh, Angela mm -hmm. Merkel was was planning an EU summit in, in Leipzig that was going to sort of hash out a lot of the um, a lot of the um, sticking points in, in Europe's trade relationship with with China, etc. Uh, and then and then there's obviously Russia, and people are wondering why uh, Merkel is not able to cancel um, the the Russian pipeline Nord Stream two uh, over the the, assass the attempted assassination of. An opposition leader, why? Why do you think is is it still so hard for Germany? Do you you seem to point out that this this is now changing and, and Germany is uh, more uh, willing to to adopt a strategic posture? Do you th do you think that Germany should adopt a more uh, a tougher stance against China and 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 uh, Russia, for instance? I mean, but the basic answer to your question is yes. Um, I mean, my book is, is, is a kind of deliberately strident uh, title, you know, why the Germans do it better. Um, they don't do everything better. I mean, I, the more accurate title, but it wouldn't have sold so well, is why, why the Germans do many, many things better much of the time. Um, but one area where they don't do uh, a lot of things better is in foreign policy, or certainly mm. in certain parts of foreign policy. Now, let's separate them out. China was always the gift that kept on giving. If you were Germany, mm. you have a disproportionate number of world beating, uh, highly skilled uh, engineering companies. Uh, Germany really is uh, one of the world leaders in high-end manufacturing. Um, some of the products are very niche. Um, some of them are very specific, but also they're kind of big prestige cachet um, brands, not least the automotive industry. And as China was bringing, what, half a billion people out of poverty and into the consumer world, all these German corporate leaders were licking their lips and just saying, wow, you know, we can just export. And it did. And it just happened. And Germany was by far um, the biggest trading partner with China. And uh, China just kept on wanting its products. Um, so what was not to like? Um, what happened was that there was corporate capture of uh, the political world, uh, particularly from the, the, the big corporate leaders. Um, and a lot of the warning signs of uh, certainly the last five years, Xi Jinping's much more aggressive Chinese foreign policy were not being heeded. That said, about two years ago, it did change and it changed pretty rapidly. I wouldn't say it's a complete 180 degree turn, but pretty much there. 
um, the German uh, Employers Federation put out a report actually saying mm. China is no longer, you know, our best friend and partner. It's a strategic competitor. And that was because what mm. China was doing was sometimes openly, sometimes by stealth, trying to buy up a lot of the um, Germany's famous Mittelstand, which is their medium sized companies. Mm. And that was seen as a, as, as a sort of direct uh, attack on Germany, uh, because these companies are not just companies, they're kind of social leaders in their community. So that really led to a big turnaround, along with the big geostrategic stuff. What China did in Hong Kong this summer really was taken badly uh, in Germany. And I think one can be pretty confident now that Germany has understood the increasing, and it's been increasing around the world, um, pressure that China is putting on countries. China is trying to buy off a lot of European countries, particularly the poorer ones in the south and southeast of Europe by um, building infrastructure for them, mm -hmm. but in return demanding political uh, obedience uh, in international forums. And G Germany sees that now. And that is one area where Germany and America are not that far apart. I mean, the tragedy and the hideousness of Trump is that he goes around insulting Merkel the whole time, literally just calling her names and and rude, much more rude about her than he ever is about any dictator. And um, and that's not the best way to win friends and to get people onto your side. But notwithstanding that, Germany is pretty close now to the US and is helping a lot of the European Union to get to that place. On Russia, it's more problematic. The pipeline, um, I've never understood it. Germany keeps on saying, oh yeah, well, it will somehow embed Russia into Europe. Well, yeah, but it's more like <laughs> Europe more more dependent on Russia and I would say possibly the single worst aspect of Germany that I just still scratch my head and can't get my head around is her, Merkel's predecessor Gerhard Schröder uh, before he left yeah. office when he lost an election in 2005 he was basically stitching up a deal whilst he was still chancellor whilst he was still leader uh, to become uh, head of one of the the boards of um, of Nord Stream, and then he became one of the big shots in Gazprom, Russia's state gas monolith, and Rosneft, the equivalent oil company. Now, I just simply cannot imagine any other country. Um, of sure, I mean, we see it with the US and Trump, and you know, we think obviously Mueller kind of didn't really get to the bottom of what was going on. There's huge suspicion here uh, in the UK that the Russians helped to fund the Brexit campaign. So Russian malfeasance is everywhere. <laughs> but there was something about the way Schroeder was just brought up by the Russians. And remarkably, how it did make a bit of a political scandal, but not nearly as much as it should have done. And it's curious. I mean, Germany and Russia are kind of physically close. They're emotionally close. Mm -hmm. um, Germans, of all... You know, the, the two great war guilts that Germany, Germany feels, one is the one that we know about, which is the Holocaust um, and the, the terrible crimes that Germany committed. And it's very upfront about that and its um, teachings, um, overcoming history and, and, and learnings about history are very thorough. The, the part of, of German war history... But I think it's less known in other countries, it's very well known here in Germany, is what it was like to Russia. I mean, it was, mm. it was a, uh, not just a war on the Eastern Front, it was a genocidal war, and it was an ethnically based genocidal war in which Germans believed that their, uh, their skin, their ethnicity was superior to the Slavs. And uh, mm. populations were massacred. So there is still a curious guilt, um, an understandable guilt, that seems to uh, cloud German visions um, about uh, Russia. And, and there's one thing to enjoy Russia. And, you know, I live there and I, I too see many, many great sides of, of that country, its literature, its culture, um, the warmth of the people. But they somehow mix Russia and Putin, and that's obviously where the danger. It's also it's also interesting because um, 
Merkel and Putin don't really get along that much. You know, there's this famous incident of um, of Putin having a dog, despite knowing that Merkel had a trauma <laughs> with dogs. Um, and yeah. despite the kind of very chilly personal relationship, the kind of geopolitical relationship hasn't changed that much since um, 2005 and Gerhard Schroeder being ousted. Well, it has and it hasn't. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the Labrador incident is just... It's kind of funny in a sort of um, morbid way. Um, you know, Putin knew that he had a phobia of dogs, and so he got his Labrador into a photo op uh, with him and her. And she's she's a remarkable person. She has almost complete impulse control, um, while at the same time being quite a warm character. Mm. And she was both frightened and furious. Um, and when Putin then joked, oh, I didn't realise that um, he was scared of dogs, uh, she then remarked uh, to the effect, which was a deliberate uh, slight to Putin in front of the cameras, oh, does he eat journalists too? Um, <laughs> and, and she really doesn't, and she and you, does you, not you, like, you, you, point you out can John. see the body language, look at any uh, YouTube videos of, of Merkel and Putin. She really, I mean, she doesn't like Trump either, but that's kind of, you know, that goes with the territory. But she um, absolutely does not like Putin. And, yeah, I mean, the Nord Stream thing, if you put that to one side and a few other things you put to one side, she's actually been pretty strong. I mean, when Russia uh, invaded uh, or helped the invasion of eastern Ukraine, when Russia annexed Crimea and when Russia uh, ostensibly was responsible for the shooting down of a Malaysian airliner um, over Ukraine, she, and it was she, who basically got the entire European Union to impose sanctions. And they were quite tough sanctions. And then she strengthened mm -hmm. them more. And they're still there. So she, she knows how to be tough. But she also knows that it's difficult for her to pull German public opinion along with, uh, along with mm -hmm. her. Yeah. And it's, it's really, you know, it's really reassuring uh, to hear you kind of framing in, in those terms and to see that there's, you know, a lot of people in, in, in Germany that, that resent the kind of uh, behavior you, you described there from, from uh, Schroeder. And, um, you know, and, and, and I think a lot of people outside of Germany kind of wonder, uh, you know, is it not hypocritical for Merkel and to, to lecture other countries about being tough on, on, on Putin when she's not she doesn't seem, and, and again, really read that the best outcome here is to deprive the Russians of an, of an access here to, to sell their gas cheaply in Europe. But, but it's really interesting to hear that, you know, the debate is not fully settled here on this court, even among Germans. But I want to I want to turn here to an immigration question, which is which is another long and great chapter in your book. You describe how the way that Germany dealt with the 2015 inflow of, of refugees was very much marked by a sort, sort of a, a sentiment of moral repentance, right, and, and a feeling of, of duty, you know, and that, and that very much colored uh, Germany's uh, image, public image in, in, in other countries, right? People saw Germans kind of, you know, open their arms and open their, their doors to, um, to these needy refugees that were coming in. And, and, I, and I wonder, you know, there's, there's also another side to the picture, right? And you see Germany doesn't have quite that um, you know, benign public image in, in countries that were very loath to um, to accepting refugees, let alone have you know Merkel sort of allocate these different quotas. You hear, you hear a lot of you know anti-Merkel rhetoric in countries like Poland and, and Hungary, and even in, in Italy and the pro uh, previous government of, of Matteo Salvini. And I wonder, what do you, th how do you think that history is going to uh, remember Merkel on this score? You know, there's obviously the good and the bad. Uh, do you think that? Um, that she, she made a good call here in policy that you described that she termed as, you know, we can do it. Uh, we need to accept that history impels us to accept these refugees. How do you think she's, that that's going to go down in, in history? One of, the, one of the nicknames for Merkel is, she, is um, she's called the Handy Chancellor. Now, Handy in German is the word for a cell phone. And mm. um, the reason uh, that she's called that is that she has this image that she never decides anything until mm. she's uh, SMSed the very last person um, to get their opinion. In other words, mm. ultra cautious. She tries to square everybody and get everybody on both board, and she doesn't take risks. And to a large extent, that's true, except on the on the few uh, occasions when she doesn't. And the refugee story was a remarkable story. Um, it's worth remembering the photographs. You one will remember um, that horrible picture of the dead tiny toddler boy 
um, on a Turkish beach. Uh, the, the pictures of uh, people in rickety boats being uh, taken across the Mediterranean by <clears throat> evil doing um, uh, transporting uh, transporters. Um, and the situation was abject. Um, the Syrian war uh, was going on and entire cities being bombed and entire populations being displaced. Now, they then all land up in uh, Greek islands, Italian islands, notably Lampedusa, and start this incredible human caravan, uh, sort of almost reminiscent of ancient times, of uh, walking most of the time uh, up through Europe. Um, and through some of the poorer parts of Europe, the Balkans, um, on their way to richer countries, all in uh, regarded as being in the north. And the further they went, the, the greater the um, impediments put in their way, barbed wire being placed, um, unsanitary refugee, temporary refugee camps, police with sniffer dogs and tear gas, and the situation was getting out of control, and it was also just hideous. One could look at statistics and talk about politics, but you just need to remember the pictures. And um, so these people pretty much knocking on Germany's door. Now, as Merkel said herself, what was I, a German, supposed to do? Question mark. And then she says rhetorically, was I supposed to build camps? You know, obviously, mm. the loaded term camps. Um, and... She knew that whatever she decided was going to have to be the lesser of evils. There was no good decision to take. Mm. So she opened the doors, and she didn't just open the doors. In typical German style, they organized it in such a way as it would be reasonably orderly and well-managed in a very difficult situation. And again, you may remember the pictures of these people turning up on trains at Munich train station with signs saying, welcome in English, and and all this sort of thing. And it's estimated that uh, around a half of all Germans did in that early pe period volunteering and donated stuff and set up soup kitchens, uh, you know, made people cups of tea and put them up and, and all that sort of thing. So it was a remarkable story. And fast forward to now, about a third of them, including people, some people who were very well educated mm -hmm. and, and, and highly skilled, but many people who were not, and completely unfamiliar with you know, a, a, a central northern European mindset and weather and everything else. Um, uh, about a third of them have been completely integrated, good job or re reasonable jobs, and, and getting on with things, which I think in a period of five years is pretty remarkable. But of course, she took a huge amount of political damage. The AFD, the far right party, was on the rampage and doing very well. Uh, and it still is doing very well, although I think there's some, some reasonable hope uh, and expectation that it may well have passed its peak and be going down now. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of resentment in Germany, particularly in the former GDR and in, in the five eastern uh, regions, um, some of that resentment is kind of understandable. People are feeling annoyed about unification anyway, but a lot of it I just find small-minded and I have no truck with and yeah, I mean, the Hungarians, particularly the Austrians, you know, the Balkans um, were furious with her for being seen to be encouraging it, but she wasn't encouraging it. She was simply saying, what am I supposed to do? They're here anyway. Um, mm. And she did actually in, in much return to much more pragmatic politics and basically do a deal, a fairly kind of dirty deal or a deal anyway with Turkey's authoritarian leader Erdogan basically to keep them all there in return for sort of German sort of assistance and support for Turkey, which is basically the situation now. But yeah, I mean, politics is, is always the kind of a gray area, but I just think this is one of those areas when one can carp and one can criticize and those criticisms can be valid, but you should not take your eye off the big picture, which is, I just think it was an act of incredible bravery. So you talk a lot about um, Angela Merkel's prudence, uh, the, the handy chancellor. Um, but there's one, one sphere where it has been especially obvious for most of her time as chancellor was European affairs. Um, and essentially every time you'd have projects for further integration, 
she kind of cautiously backed down and joined the the UK or the now called Hanseatic League. Um, and then she kind of budged over the last few months because of COVID, because of other reasons. But she essentially uh, went along with Macron's plans for further integration, uh, creating EU-wide debt instruments, a mass investment plan, um, and even you know, exchanging blows with her former allies in the Netherlands or Scandinavia. All these issues for a very long time had been major red flags in, in German policy. Um, so why, why do you think we're seeing, we're witnessing this change? Do you think it's German public opinion which has been changing? Do you think Angela Merkel is in the twilight of Korea, so she wants to create her legacy? Or do you think that German national interests have simply shifted it at all? I mean, COVID has changed so much. And I think one of the um, sh shocks to Germans and to others in Europe was the speed with which countries reverted to kind of national borders, physical borders, and also national interest above a common European interest, which was the whole point of the European Union. Um, so the speed with which uh, that happened at the start of COVID, which obviously on health grounds was completely understandable, uh, was a bit of a reality check for her and for Germans. And um, leaving Brexit to one side, which didn't show the fragility of the EU, just showed the sort of weirdness of the UK, um, because the rest of the EU has made it pretty darn clear that they're not going to, having seen what's happened to the UK, they're not going to leave in a hurry. But at the same time, it has COVID has shown the fragility of the EU. Um, in that uh, the speed, as I say, with which countries look after their own. Um, and so she realized, uh, as did others, as, as did Macron, that if Germany as the real paymaster of Europe uh, didn't change its tune and didn't open up uh, more resource and allow for more borrowing of European countries, and not only would they suffer enormous economic damage, and she'd been through it once before, in the uh, debt crisis of 10 years earlier and had become the object of huge animosity around Europe. Um, so she saw uh, the problems of what happened 10 years before, but she also saw that, you know, this could s hugely undermine the EU by driving countries, particularly Italy at the time and Spain to a degree, uh, into incredible poverty and political instability. So again, she did what she felt she needed to do. Yes, it was a complete reversal of, of the, the previous austerity-driven uh, economic approach. But, um, uh, you know, nobody is starry-eyed anymore about the extent to which uh, the EU is fragile. Maybe, back, you were asking about um, COVID just a, a second ago, Francois. Maybe, um, how do you think, and, and this will be our, our last question, um, as I understand, you're, you're, you're based in Germany right now, right, John? How is, how is the country dealing with this? Is, is there any sort of a panic about a possible, that you know, this possibly stretching into 2021? How's that fear sort of going down with, with the German people? Well, I mean, it's quite funny for me. Um, I've been sort of, I, I um, divide my time between London and Berlin. And whenever in uh, and when I'm here, I, I can listen to the BBC and, and listen to the and watch the TV chat shows, the UK ones. And the questions, the second or first question to every government minister is, why can't you do it a bit more like Germany when it comes to COVID? <laughs> Everything, whether it's uh, health models, um, the job retention scheme that the UK has, they're now going to remodel on the German uh, um, model. Uh, education, provision, everything is like, why can't you do it like the Germans? Uh, and the Germans see that and they hear that. They hear that that's what's being said, not just in the UK and other countries too. And they take a certain pride, but they don't really like taking pride too much um, in that uh, picture of themselves. And yeah, it, um, it's, it's really not too bad here in Berlin. Um, people are frightened of or wary of, concerned about, um, this fall and winter and um, COVID so far has been okay because across much of Europe, including uh, the UK, the weather was pretty much good from the get-go, from the start of um, of lockdown. And it's not going to be like in, in, in long November, December nights, stretching into, into Q1 next year. Uh, it's going to be difficult for everyone and it's going to be difficult here too. Uh, numbers are, are beginning to increase. Um, they take a much more regionalized approach. The regional governments have much more power. Mm -hmm. to, so there are some quite strong regional variations in terms of restrictions being um, being made on people. And it's going to get worse again. Um, that There's no doubt everybody is 
But, you know, they're pretty responsible on public transport. Everybody wears masks in restaurants. If you have to get up to go to the washroom or uh, certainly in shops everywhere, people wearing masks, there's very little physical mm. contact. So they know what to do. They know it's going to get worse. But I must say, you know, uh, if I was going to, you know, feel feeling, if I were feeling vulnerable and in danger of COVID, there are very few places in the world I would rather be than in Germany in terms of knowing that I'd be reasonably well looked after. <laughs> That's a wonderful way to, to put it. And we really want to thank you, John, for, for um, sharing with us your, your time this morning and your thoughts. And we wish you all the best with the rollout of this book. Uh, we encourage everyone to head over to Amazon and buy Why the Germans Do It Better. Um, and again, John, we look forward to, to speaking to you on another occasion. And thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. And good luck with your event. Thank you so much. Great. Well, that's a, that's a wrap for um, the second episode of Uncommon Decency, and, and John is out. Um, Francois, what did, you, what did you think of the second episode? It was a great second episode. Um, it felt very natural for me because I'd literally finished the book a few hours before the interview, so it felt like a very natural flow, continuum. Um, yeah, it's a very good book. Uh, we kind of underestimate the challenges that um, Germany has been through over the past three decades. Um mm. John was in Berlin in 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell. It was a great moment of enthusiasm, but also a massive challenge to reunite two countries which had been divided like that. And mm. they've done a remarkable job at it. But even if you go back two decades ago, you had The Economist writing um, op-eds about how Germany was a sick man in Europe. Unemployment yeah. was was much higher in Germany than it was in France. And now all of a sudden you've got this, uh, this amazing uh, German economy doing so well nowadays. So that's, an, that's a very impressive turnaround. It's a very good explanation of that turnaround. So it's a good book for that. Yeah, and I, 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 I got to say, I, I don't think I was ever aware that the expression, the now so popular expression that has been, you know, uh, tagged onto Spain, mm. Ireland, every Southern economy, this, this um, epithet of, of the sick man of Europe, um, that, it, that it goes all the way back to Germany post-reunification. I, I was really struck to... to, to to learn that from the book. Well, you, the sick man in Europe expression, if you want to push it really, really far back, you could go back to um, uh, to the early 20th century when the Ottoman Empire was called the sick man oh. in Europe. So regularly the sick man in Europe changes. Um, now that said, speaking of kind of history, I think one aspect which surprised me is the, how strong the pro-Russian sentiment was in Germany. Because for obvious historical mm. reasons, I would expect it to be to be to be have a to have a strong anti-Russian sentiment in mm. Germany, but not so mm. much. Um, so I thought that, that came as a bit of a surprise, um, but it also explains why why uh, Germany's um, foreign policy on Russia has been a bit mm. unclear. Um, as he says, uh, and rightfully so, Germany has pushed for very harsh sanctions against Russia over Ukraine, but at the same time, uh, Nord Stream do, two is pretty much over. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a it's an impressive contrast, and I think he he. He explains it well, given the um, given the um, strong public opinion sentiment in in Germany over Russia, but one that comes as a surprise to me. And I that it I, I got to say it's I was um, positively surprised with John's um, kind of you know treading a fine line there with the whole um, uh, Nord Stream uh, pipeline issue and Navalny. Uh, I, I you know I, I know there's a lot of sort of whataboutism in Germany these days. I think. Um, I, I was really glad to hear John pounce and lambast, um, as as anyone should, uh, Gerhard Schroeder for for being just a, a prop, a Russian prop, and having yeah. you know taken up this this six figure lobbying job with uh, Gazprom, I believe, right, or, or one of its affiliates. I, I was really glad that John was able to reconcile um, an appreciation of Germany's uh, soft approach to some of the foreign policy challenges it faces, while also demanding of it greater toughness when it matters such as with uh, um, Nord Stream and Navalny. I think, I think another point which, he, he, which was interesting is on, is on China. Mm. Um, for a very long time, um, China was seen as fantastic news for Germany, mm. massive market they could export their products to. Um, but you could also see that on China, despite Germany being less naive about China, um, you know, there's a famous employer federations report mm. on China, which labels... 
um, it's a systemic rival, that's a pretty major change. Mm. But you, you could also sense that even in, in, in business, in German business, they're still not too sure how, how to deal with China. Mm. So um, he gives this example in the book, but when all the, all the big bosses of Germany's largest companies um, go to go with Merkel to China and, and meet Xi Jinping, mm. um, they leave Merkel hanging when Merkel starts talking about IP theft and all these other unacceptable business practices. Yeah. And all the bosses are kind of very awkward about it because they, they don't want to be singled out. Um, so you, you can sense that they're still very uncomfortable and unsure how to position them, themselves. And I think it goes back to kind of a weakness in German foreign policy is one of their major strengths is also one of their major weaknesses is because their exporting industries are so powerful, yeah. especially um, uh, the automobile sector. Yeah, it also yeah. means every single time you've got a, a foreign power which is willing to press Germany just a little bit on that one sector, Germany is aban- is ready to abandon whatever um, stance it has to meet those demands. Mm. Um, and it's also a weakness for Europe because every time uh, we enter negotiations with the United States, with any other country, especially the United States, Trump can just say, I'm going to slap a 20% tariff on all, all um, German cars. Yeah. And all of a sudden, Germany caves, and then Europe caves because if Germany caves, obviously yeah. Europe caves. So I think that's 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 a that's a weakness. We didn't get to talk about it, but I thought I thought it's a kind of it's, um, yeah. It's it's yes. really it's really interesting there. What you mentioned, it's almost as if you know the the car makers and the pensioners are wielding major power, and they do so also on international trade. As you mentioned, there was I believe there was a a trade dispute yeah. back in in 2018. So in, in the early days of kind of Trump's trade antics, you had that one moment where. Uh, Trump was threatening um, to hike to sort of hike uh, tariffs on on German cars, and they yeah. they reached an agreement through uh, Rick Grinnell, who was then an, an, a U.S. ambassador in Berlin. But but as you said, the the the, yeah. the issue of you know, and and Trump has repeatedly kind of boasted about um, attracting all, all all this investment towards. Um, South Carolina, Alabama, states like that from German car making companies that have just recently, well, well, uh, I believe there has been plans there for a while now, but they've been recently expanded uh, after uh, Trump's uh, tax reform. Um, So as you said, the the, the car makers are really kind of front and center of of, uh, Germany's and Germany's kind of dealings with the world. And um, yeah, and just going off of what you were describing there with China, I do feel like Germany's uh, appeasing or conciliatory approach to China, and I wouldn't want to sort of describe that in that way, but in relative terms, it is probably the most uh, pro appeasement uh, country of the certainly in sort of the major powers within within Europe. And um, you know, it, it's interesting because they, as John was explaining, Germany was planning. Uh, well, the EU as a whole was planning a major summit uh, this year. Uh, that would have taken place in Leipzig with, without COVID. It was really mm-hmm. Merkel taking a lead and, and kind of hashing out um, what, what the EU's position was going to be ahead of that that meeting. And, um, and you know, and I just want to go off of what you said there, because you, you were explaining that, you know, um, German business interests have tended to lobby and yeah. influence Germany's foreign policy position on the issue of China towards a more conciliatory um, approach. But even on... Um, even on the issue of, do you remember there was a case? Um, there was a case earlier this year where the EU was going to issue a, a report on Chinese disinformation efforts, where yeah. the EU had like this task force. Uh, I believe it, it was part of the um, um, the the EU the, the European External Action Service, the foreign policy arm of, of the bloc, and they were coming up with this report that was just going to like very coldly and, and objectively document, like list all of the instances where China had been interfering in like. Uh, the public's perception of COVID, they had been um, like, you know, uh, filling up. Yeah, I remember that. They, yeah. they, it was published though, if I remember correctly, they accused China of, uh, of peddling this information over COVID. It yeah. was back when China was, was doing all those photo ops of giving masks to European countries. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And it, it pissed off a few people, yeah. That's exactly right. And they, they yeah. already made major inroads in Italy, obviously, with major kind of aid um, uh, efforts. Uh, I believe in, in parts of Central Europe as well, but at, at just at that time, as that was unfolding, you had that report coming out of some bureaucrats' office in, in the EU, and it wasn't going to make that much of a splash. But the reason it did was because um, China lobbied uh, the the Chinese Communist Party uh, lobbied um, the EU ambassador in Beijing to hold off on releasing that report. Mm. And the EU ambassador in, in Berlin 
uh, no wonder was a German. And the, the, that sort of influence, um, I, I believe they held off the report for a few days and then they toned it down. And that was kind of a major, um, that like, like uh, China hawks in the US and in Europe were pointing fingers at, at, at Germany being like, why do you kowtow to this blatant yeah. effort at misinforming the European public? And you had this report coming out and you, you toned it down. Um, but yeah. Well, you know, it's it's really interesting. There's something else that I that I found, and I, I think you were speaking to this at the start, uh, Frankie. Um, you um, you said my general sense with uh, John's um, book. I, I thought it was a fantastic read. I learned so much from reading those those essays, and and um, you know, I, I the the general kind of sense I got from it was: listen, um, John and and myself or yourself, we may not. We may comment at these issues from different different sides, but you can you can you you can only admire the way that Germany has um, dealt with issues and like with like the memory of, of obviously the Holocaust and even just like the challenge of reuniting these as you said these previously um, antagonistic you know uh, two halves of Germany and, and the way they the way, the and, way they, they went. and also having the entire country crushed after World War Two absolutely know, most most German cities were ruined yeah right? and and um and, and you know yeah absolutely and and it, you know as as much as you and I can can you know disagree on on many of, of the points that John made I think on maybe on uh, some of the the, the uh, migration piece um would but mm. you can only even on the migration piece and this is the interesting part is I have much respect for the way that Angela Merkel went about handling the inflow, the massive inflow of, of refugees and of, of asylum seekers in, in 2015. It was done with, you know, a great sense of like duty uh, towards these people in need and whatever you make of whether that was the right way to go about it and whether it was right to have that imposed on, on countries that probably mm. wouldn't see that as a threat. It's just very admirable the way that the political culture in Germany is built in a way that favors consensus, openness, um, liberal democracy, as, as John was describing. So yeah, I, I really, I really like that part. It's, it's also it's a, the 2015 decision is very momentous in the sense that if you go back a bit further, in 2010, Angela Merkel, pretty much at the same time as David Cameron and, and Nicolas Sarkozy, made a mm. speech saying multiculturalism has failed us. Yeah. Um, and five years later, she does um, she does this, which is obviously a huge contrast. I think I think um, John is right in saying, "I'm the German Chancellor. What can I do? Must I mm. build camps?" I mean, she, she's right. The optics. She, he's right. The optics here are not not easy at all for Germany. Um, but I think I think in many ways, what what we're seeing after this is, especially in the CDU, a shift to the right. In that sense, Merkel is a bit of a, an exception because if you look across Europe at center right leaders or center right parties. They they either disappeared, or mm. they've shifted quite considerably, or at least quite clearly, to the right. If you look that, at that at, um, at Italy, the centre right Conservative Party is pretty much dead. If you look at Spain, mm. they've definitely shifted to the right over the next the last few months. In the UK, mm. no doubt they've shifted to the right. Um, mm. In in Hungary, no doubt they've shifted to the right over the last few years. In France, they're probably dying or, or dead. It's unclear. Um, mm. in, in Greece, they've, they've probably shifted to the right a little bit as well. Across all the major European countries, we've seen major parties shift to the right or disappear. In that sense, Anglo Merkel represents kind of a kind of an exception. Um, mm. And obviously, this is this is the twilight years of, of Merkel. Um, she survived a lot longer than anyone expected, um, um, and COVID gave her gave her new boost of popularity because um, mm. she handled it well, and Germany did it um, as well. So. But now the question is, who's going to replace her? And there's going to be um, a tough leadership um, uh, fight just to replace her. Mm. Um, so there's well, when, is that, when, it, when is that race going to be held? Who is, who's, who's on the running at CDU? Do you know? So as I said, in many ways, the CDU and, and Merkel are an mm. outlier in centre-right politics across Europe. Now, there's the leadership election um, going on right now with with the actual leadership election being on the 4th of December. Mm. So it's coming soon. And the, the two main candidates are um, Armin Laschet and um, Friedrich Mertz. Armin Laschet is a Merkel-like figure. He is the um, minister-president of 
North Rhine-Westphalia, which is a very important uh, region in, in Germany. And uh, he's more of a kind of safe, centrist pair of hands. Um, and on the side, you've got Frederick Mertz, um, who used to be a big shot of the party in, in the early 2000s before being sidelined by by um, by Merkel. And he's associated with being on much more of the right of the party. Um, so what's interesting, actually, is Mr. Lashev, um, who's more of a centrist, also got backing from people who were more to the right of the party, which implies that you know, Armin Lashev is much better at building a large coalition within the party than is Friedrich Merz. So my guess is Armin Lashev will probably win because of that kind of strong internal network he has. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if Friedrich Merz ends up being a lot more popular with the voting base because it's not the, all the CDU members don't vote. There's a, uh, there's a number of delegates who end up choosing the leader. It's not just the, um, the party base voting as a whole. And while I think Frederick Merz tends to be more popular in the base, and the base being more right-wing than Angela Merkel or Armin Laschet, I think Armin Laschet will win because the CDU is a well-drilled party which um, tends to favour centrist figures. So it's interesting. Um, so we could see Germany continuing among this path, having a very centrist centre-right party, when the rest of Europe has seen its own centre-right parties shift to the right, um, if yeah. there are still relevant forces. Yeah, and it's really interesting. I think I, it's I never um, looked at it that way, but it's absolutely true that CDU is kind of a liberal democratic holdout within the European right. Yeah. These parties are all either being contested on the right or kind of yep. shifting to the right themselves. And CDU, although obviously the Bavarian um, uh, com- uh, CSU, yeah, yeah, the, the, they, they seem to be more conservative, right? They're they're like um, yes, but but they're only in Bavaria, so and they've always been a bit country. They've always been more to the right of the party. Mm. Um, but that said, there's also the possibility that the CSU leader, which is the CDU um, uh, sister party. Marcus Soder, the leader of the CSU, could maybe end up being the leader of the of, um, oh, really? CDU. It's, it's, it's a possibility. He's also identified as being more of a conservative. Yeah, that would, uh, that more would be right. a historical first, right? That that coalition is majorly dominated by CDU, right? Yes, it will always been dominated by CDU. But again, I think the CSU kind of... Um, um, CDSU can aptly position itself as being the most right-wing party which is acceptable in the political mm-hmm. spectrum in Germany. Yeah. Um, and given the push towards the right in Germany, maybe maybe it gives a maybe it gives Marcus Soder the CSU some some room. Yeah, and it, 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 the reason I, I found what you've just described there really interesting is is because yes, to some extent, uh, CDU remains that sort of liberal democratic haven, um, yeah. primarily. Uh, I, I would say owing primarily to Merkel's own kind of personality and the way she's kept a grip on the party and the way that her own um, iron fisted, but at the same time, really humane personality. She's, she's been able to rally her party in Germany as a whole. And, and um, but, but, it, but one of the things that I found really interesting in John's book, um, and I'm curious to get your thoughts was that at some, at, at several points in the, the chapter that John has on nationalism, on sort of like historical memory and, and nationalism, there are several points where John describes politicians both within um, SDU and CDU that have been that have bought the line and that have. Been, I mean, there was, there was. I wonder if you remember this. You may have watched this, come across this somewhere. But there was there was a there was a very telling anecdote, a very telling moment at some point. I, I believe this was at a CDU convention where uh, Merkel was standing with a. Um, um, a row of um, sort of the, the the party's top brass. I, I don't know if they were like from from, some, from a specific region or just from the CDU like uh, bureau, but there was they were celebrating it. And uh, this may have been the last time she got elected, or more recently. But someone was waving a German flag, and Merkel walks up to this guy, um, her colleague, and she snaps away the German flag from his hands. I, I thought though, I mean, I was I was mm-hmm. shocked. I, I was I really was shocked. But then you you yeah. read John's book and then you kind of realize, okay, well, this is coming from a, a sense of historical yeah. repentance, a kind of an instinctive um, yeah. uh, mistrust of, of like you know pricing the nation or prizing the nation or kind of putting the nation to the on the floor, uh, which I entirely understand. I think it's historically warranted. But um, yeah, as you were saying, it's interesting. And, and but at, at some point in John's book, he does describe um, like politicians on, on both uh, the social democratic left and the Christian democratic right that have bought this tendency. 
and that have been more nationalistic. I, I was really, I'm really, I was really interested in what you just described there, um, um, like about the people that are in the running right now in CDU, and I'm glad to see that. Maybe this is just the best way that CDU can stave off uh, the IFD, because the IFD is obviously like um, the bet, the bet noir, right? Um, uh, I, I was. Yeah. Uh, what did you think? Was it? Um, did you, did you were you at all um, surprised by and John John has um, in the chapter about reunification he seems to suggest that a lot of the electoral success recently of uh, alternative of Deutschland um, is has been based uh, in the east right people who are who represent uh, liberal mm. urbanites they kind of feel left behind they come from a more kind of um, yeah. uh, rural um, eastern kind of um, uh, a part of the country was that was that striking to you well it's it's striking to me that um well it's interesting if you look at kind of germany's historical frontiers it's 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 quite amusing to see that you know borders which were made 50 100 and 200 years ago still matter and i, and I think you know i think he's right that the experience of the soviet experience has definitely made the Aussies of eastern germany and the Westies of western germany little different, you know, and, and that yeah. cultural divide has, has apparently uh, um, uh, widened a little bit over the last few years or so. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm not surprised. It's, um, I mean, it's, it's the equivalent of, you know, the, uh, the flyover states feeling yeah. abandoned. I, yeah. think, I think there's, there's a lot of symbolism there. Um, and um, I think it's in, yeah, I think, I think it's well analyzed. It's not just East, Eastern Germany. Um, mm. You know, you 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 also see it in, in other parts of of Germany. You know, slightly more rural, smaller towns. Mm. Um, uh, but there's definitely obviously, obviously a other representation in Eastern Germany. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, what did you think? Let me ask you about the migration piece because I, you know, I, I really, uh, I you know, I, I have mixed feelings about the issue as a whole. Um, very conflicted myself, but I, I was, you know, I, I really appreciated how John kind of walks you through in his book. He walks you through how Germany itself was grappling with the issue as the crisis unfolded. Like even after um, uh, Merkel went out and said, as, as you said, uh, "What is a German chancellor supposed to do?" And yeah. she she had that sort of motto, uh, which I'm, I'm hope I'm mean, like, don't make me try, even try to pronounce this in German. But she said, "We can do this." Yeah. And, um, um, and, um, and obviously then you had like, you had a couple of, um, kind of, um, fever pitches in that crisis where she was like, she was, um, conversing with like a Syrian, a young Syrian refugee, a teenager, really, she was mm. stopping at this like TV broadcast and Merkel wasn't very kind of tactful in, in dealing with her. And that was, um, that wasn't really, that, that was one of the ways where Merkel was seen as like, you're actually, um, you're actually, um. What, like in the rest of Europe, we see Merkel as having like opened the, the floodgates, right? And, and yeah. having like struck this deal where like uh, she was going to impose these quotas on, on the countries. But it, it probably didn't go down quite that way in German public opinion. Uh, it, she probably like she probably had, as John explained, some 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 um, like comments in the media where where people were um, were very people resented it presented that Merkel wasn't even more. Um, um, uh, kind of like humane with these refugees, and and um, uh, there's also the issue of like, in which John explains um, the the Cologne, the 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 New Year's Eve um, yeah. events in, in Cologne, which really struck the conscience of a lot of the country, even though they were kind of kept under wraps by the police for a while. But yeah, yeah the, 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 the the mass rapes in Cologne. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, I, th I think there's a there's a it's definitely a shift that point because before that it was a very optimistic narrative about how Germany could do this and how um, and it's a great story you know Germany the, the country of, of uh, the country of, of, of the Holocaust and whatnot um, all of a sudden became this welcoming their real country but it underestimated a large extent the, the cultural challenges it posed yeah. not even the economic challenges which obviously going to be huge because you're some of them have diplomas and are educated the rest of it, but a lot of them aren't, or if they have diplomas, you know, Germany doesn't really need that many low-skilled um, uh, immigrants, you know, it's a very mm. high, high, um, highly trained, um, 
highly trained workforce. So in the language and so on. So I think it was a, it was an underestimation. But the, the, the cultural divide is one which which I think nobody saw coming, and he's not that mm. that powerfully. And that definitely shifted the narrative. And after that, you, you it's, it's no longer the same thing. Um, with, uh, there's a lot of attempts to restrict, and then there's also don't forget the terrorist attacks, which are happening at the same moment. The rest of it. Mm. In, in, a, in a few weeks, in France especially, a few weeks of narrative changes. Um, and that's why the AFD rose. It's, it, it definitely it definitely changes everything. That's a wrap for the second episode of uh, Uncommon Decency. We're very glad that you uh, listened to us and, and could join us this time as well. We're going to, again, ask uh, our audience to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Your comments and five-star re- reviews mm-hmm. and ratings are going to help other listeners find this podcast. And if you'd like to get in touch with us, we are very keen to get your questions and comments. We, you can tweet us. You can tweet at us. Uh, the handle is at UndecencyPod. And you can also email us your questions at UncommonDecencyPod at gmail.com.